Welcome to In the Landscape, a podcast on all things landscape design and care related with your hosts, Kate and Charles Sadler. Welcome to a special episode of In the Landscape. I'm your host, Kate Sadler, and today I'm in studio to introduce a special episode of the podcast, which is actually a live radio interview that was recorded a few weeks ago with the host of Into the Garden on WDVR-FM 89.7 out of the southeastern New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. And that was Charles Sadler speaking with host Carl Moulter and his co-host Ruth Mummy of Bell's Flower Nursery, all about boxwood. And uh, it's a topic obviously near and dear to our hearts. (laughs) So we've returned to boxwood here to present this special episode. We do want to give special credit to the Penn Jersey Radio Corporation. And we'll be sure to link to Bell's Flower Nursery and the radio station and get you all those credits in our show notes. We hope you enjoy this special episode and we look forward to being in the studio again next week to bring you another episode of In the Landscape. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Into the Garden. I, I, I would call this our post-fundraising show, but uh, we didn't make our goal, so we're still certainly uh, willing to uh, take anything you have in order to uh, support the station, support the show. And uh, I will give out the show number shortly, because I remind you, this is Carl Moulter. I'm your host. And uh, this week, Phil has off. In the next two weeks, Phil is going to have off. But I'm very excited. I have uh, a guest co-host with me today, and she is Ruth Mummy of Bell's Flower Nursery in Stockton, New Jersey, across the console. Ruth, welcome to the show. Thank you, Carl. It's great to be here, and I hope everyone's enjoying this fabulous fall weather. Oh, isn't this glorious? Yeah, it is. And I hope Phil has a chance to enjoy it. I th- with a day off. <laughs> I, th- I think he is. He's probably Good. out there making every ounce or every minute of that daylight. That's great. That's out there. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you for, for coming on and helping out with the next hour. Well, it's my pleasure. I just live down the street. And you have, you've been on uh, at least two shows in the past. I think so. Yes. With my garden. I, I'm a, a home gardener more than anything else, but we do have a nursery where we raise um, flowering shrubs and hollies. Well, I, I've seen your garden. It's stellar. Oh, thank you. It really is. So again, thank you. I'm honored to have you on. Well, actually. thank you. It's very kind of you to ask me. So I'm going to put out the show number if you would, for some reason, you couldn't donate. Because again, that's what keeps the show to, to get corny in the green. <laughs> and that's area code 609-397-1620, extension 5. Ruth will, will, will uh, gladly take your pledge. Very gladly. <laughs> and again, every, every bit goes, not going for, for me and it's not going for Ruth or Phil or anybody. It, it goes for WDVR, this wonderful station here that we're so lucky to have in the Delaware Valley. But let's onward now. We, we, have, a, we have a guest that we have to call. And uh, I, I, there was a lot of buzz in the social media because today's show is going to be devoted to what I consider the king or queen. That's, you, know, you can argue that. Of landscape shrubs, and that's I would say that's the boxwood. Yeah, I agree heartily. 
And I don't know what it is about these plants. They, I guess, because they are, they're obviously evergreen and unchanging. They're so versatile. And here with their deer resistance, the deer don't care for them. It's the answer to have something green all winter that the deer are not going to munch on. You took the words right out of my mouth. So they've become sort of a backbone of sorts to a lot of planting designs. But anyway, I, we have, we're going to be calling someone, this, this man, he has offices in Houston, Hastings on Hudson, New York, and then Greenwich, Connecticut. So this guy, he specializes in very high-end garden design and maintenance. And his name is Charles King Sadler. And uh, he really, uh, it, again, I, I'll, uh, I'm honored to have him on. And one of his specialties is boxwoods, caring for the boxwoods on a lot of these very large estates. And we can never learn enough about them because there's so many different varieties. Oh, my goodness, yes. So that's what this hour is going to be. So let me um, check in my list here. Oh, before I forget, I want to thank Pam from Milford. She donated last week after my show. If you're listening out there, Pam, thank you for that donation. If you were just tuning in, this is Into the Garden with Carl. And Phil is out today. He'll be out for the next two weeks. He's given him a break. So I have Ruth Mummy of Bell's Flower Nursery. She's a local nursery just outside of the downtown Surgeonsville area. Ruth, again, thank you for helping out. It's my pleasure. That's it's always see- fun to be here. Yeah, it's great to see you again, too. Thank you. So, Well, anyway, we should have Charles King Sadler of King Garden Design on the line. Charles, are you there? Oh. Oh, you have no how happy I am to hear when this works. <laughs> Modern technology. <laughs> well, Charles, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So, so I, I'm going to remind our listeners, we're going to be, I mean, there's many things we can talk about garden design for the next hour, but we're going to be focusing on boxwoods. I think I've hit the right man for the job <laughs> to discuss this, just watching your social media. Do you think so? So, oh. calls we travel all over North America these days for playing boxwood doctor or or boxwood designer. <laughs> well, they they come to play a very very critical role in our garden design. But Charles, first let's uh, first of all, I just want to tell our listeners you're, you're out in Houston right now, Houston, Texas. Right, correct. And we have an office in New York, Connecticut. And we over the last year we've gotten work in Texas. So we have relatives here, so we actually moved, my family and I moved here. So I'm here probably about three weeks a month, and then I'm in out of New York the other week. I'm just curious, there's a bit of a uh, flash with, with the weather, I imagine, the temperatures right. at least. Correct. You know, like some of the plants, New York and New England is sort of one range of the species. So that's, the boxwood is that it's sort it's like the length, like the red maple boxwood. It can grow from about New York to Texas, or so sort of on the very edge of its of its range. <laughs> well, Charles, you, you kind of have a, have an ist- interesting story to tell as far as your background. Maybe you can give us that briefly. Oh, sure. My God, I started out as a young person as an illustrator. I had the visual, the, the, the design training, and I went back to school for landscape architecture. One of my early jobs, it was a landscape architecture practice in Westchester County, New York, and they, they were affiliated with a nursery. So that's really where I got exposed to that box one wasn't just like a green ball, and there wasn't just one kind of, one variety. Sort of by installing gardens in the Hudson Valley and in New England and in beautiful Philadelphia, the mainland gardens, there's such, there are lots of mature gardens. So caring for the garden is often a component of the design. So our, our practice is somewhat unique in that we really do both because it's often needed. We, maybe there's the addition of a new part of a garden and then there might be an ailing or a failing part of a garden. So I see opportunity in that instead of just wiping it clean, which is unfortunately is often done with people don't understand pruning and how some the, the plants are so valuable, really like when you visit the propagators in the nurseries, you see plants respond really well to pruning and into certain techniques. So there's, they're much more adaptable than, than people might understand. Charles, could you describe for our listeners, when you say mainline and like the Westchester area, what are these gardens like that you're finding? There would be a range. So 
on the like historic large scale, it might be a New York socialite, Brooke Astor. She had a property called Holly Hill that's sort of in the lower Hudson Valley, in Westchester County. So there are properties like that that are 25, 50, 100 acres that have gardens that are about 100 years old or so, the night, like the Roaring Twenties or the turn of the century. On those properties, there are boxwood, the Olmstead, Frederick Law Olmstead, Olmstead Brothers designed. And there are still various levels of those gardens in existence that we come across. So that's sort of on the big scale. And then there are properties that are, let's say, one, two, three acres. They might have mature gardens. And then on the other end, it's maybe urban gardens, Manhattan, like a townhouse garden. That would be on the smaller scale. And there's the contemporary robber barons that are sometimes uh, hedge fund people or Silicon Valley people. And they're creating sometimes new gardens, which also utilize boxwood. Yes. And we're going to be getting to why that is. But so you, 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 you went off on your own with, with this right, niche. Correct. You know, it was you know, that and maybe it's a little bit of naivete, a little bit of arrogance where you're, where you're working for a company. You think, you know what? I think I could do this better. Or, or the company says, you know, we don't do, we don't provide that service. We just plant or we just design or we just prune. So to me, it's that it's all design, you know, that like knowing the right plant in the right place, pruning it at the right time, that's all. To have a successful garden, it really takes all, all those components working together. And when you're not, when you don't understand the components, and it might look good initially and then never look again, or, or it can become overgrown. So to me, it's, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of gratification too. Charles, you had the wonderful analogy you had given me earlier of that of a conductor who not, is not the composer, but still is very important in bringing the piece to life. That's, that's what you do partially. Right, correct. You know, there's firms to do work in your beautiful region. There's uh, Louis Binoc, who's out of Paris. There's Jubilee, who's out of the UK. There's Doyle Herman, that's out of Greenwich. Then there's historic, like I said, the Olmsted Brothers, Beatrice Ferran, Penelope Hubhouse. So, to me, those gardens are so special. You can feel the designer's intent. So there's even sort of a specialization that we provide, we call design care. And so it's pruning the garden, caring for it, and making sure the intention of that original designer is maintained. What, pruning care, I lo- or garden care? I love that. Oh, like design care, really. Design care. The, wow. How okay. you care for it. I mean, the, the most beautiful pruning is when people say, it doesn't look like you even did anything, but you can't tell. When you get a good haircut, it looks, it looks nice. It doesn't look like you got scalped. You're like, ooh, I can tell you got a haircut. <laughs> that looks painful. And that's often what pruning, it's not done. Maybe it's not done at the right time of year, or it's not the, it's not the appropriate tool for that plant. It gets it into the right shape, possibly, but it leaves scars. You know, so the plants, the boxwood are pruned significantly during the heat of the summer. Those leaves are going to turn brown. It's going to look brown maybe until the end of the summer. Uh, okay, okay, it's all in the timing. You're stressing the plan anytime you come at it with shears. Right, correct. Right, so there's like a person you go in for surgery, they put you under anesthesia, and then they perform the surgery. So I'm a, just from some of it's my training and then some of it's experience of having good mentors of uh, dormant season pruning. So that applies to almost all plants. Pruning them, I used to be careful. So you don't you don't prune it when there's going to be a big snowstorm. But like in the Philadelphia area, let's say it's March, you could still get a snowstorm. Or it could be very cold. So it's probably end of March, beginning of April. The plant, like a boxwood, is still dormant then, and the threat of a serious storm is probably pretty minimal. So like for an overgrown boxwood, that's a great time. You can significantly reduce it. Also thin it, where you're you're taking sections out of it, but but the profile is still the same size. And then what happens is that stored energy in the roots has not been spent yet; it's still in reserve. And then when it starts to grow, that reserve energy is distributed to whatever part of the plant it remains. Interesting, well, Charles. Let's let's jump back up. I this I'm going to. Start with uh, this is the section of a what show I call Blank for Dummies. So this is a right. boxwood for dummies. We may have listeners who have heard the term, familiar with it, but have no idea. 
of, or very little idea of maybe the, the plants that they see when they're touring a, a colonial garden. And there's that very uh, distinctive smell, which I personally really like, but some people don't. But l maybe let's jump into just basically what are boxwoods? So what's, what is this, this species, this family? Well, let's see, it's, it's an, it tends to be an evergreen shrub. There are some that are not. I haven't seen many of those, but it's, so if you think of your fingernails, some of the dwarf boxwoods, the leaves would be about the size of your pinky nail. That'd be about the smallest. And if you think of, of your, of the other like three fingers on your hand, it, the leaves would be about that size. Some of the Asian varieties, the Korean or the Japanese, those leaves are a little rounder and larger, and that would be like about the size of your thumbnail. So they come in, there are dwarf sizes that would just be like, like 10 inches tall, what I call like the straight species, which would be the American boxwood, the common boxwood. That would grow, if you just planted that and left it, it's going to get to be about six feet by six feet, eight feet by eight feet over, over its, its lifetime, you know, roughly. And then there are types that are very upright, where it's like fastidious, very skinny. And there are types that are almost a ground cover. One of those types is called Franklin's Gem, which is probably, you know, the, after Ben Franklin. <laughs> so there's a very wide range of sizes, shapes. There's even a, a variegated variety that has a, like a cream color and green. Would you say the, the one that's most notable I, from historic gardens is the English? Boxwood. Right, correct. You see that? That's, that's the very small leaf, like the size of your pinky nail. It grows very slowly. It's a very tight shape. It grows very slowly. It has that distinctive uh, odor. And very, the texture is, is fine. And it's, it's a, I would say it's a delightful green. Right. It's like, it's like a cheerful, you know, from an artist's palette, it's more yellow in it than blue. It's like a, like a warmer green. I, and that's how I would. And I think historically, it's it's native to to England, right? Correct. So the you know, colonists brought that here. Like almost every continent has, when I mean, many continents have a native boxwood originally. There's some South America, Europe, Asia. So which kinds do you see mostly in these old gardens, and and what's being planted onwards? Like you said, the English boxwood, the dwarf. So boxwoods, is boxes is the Latin name. So fruticosa is the English, which is the you know the slow growing. Yes. Then boxes sempervirens, which is that's the it's often called the American boxwood, the common. Those two, I would say, in the historic gardens, that's often what you're seeing. At Holly Hill in the Mid Hudson, had an alley, a double row of boxwood, 150 feet long, that were like over 100 years old. And those were almost mostly. America, the American. And then there was a section at the end where it dropped in height and it was the English. Okay. At this point, I'd like to bring Ruth in. R Ruth, uh, your bell's flower, you grow boxwoods. We do. We have uh, several different varieties, but almost all, I mean, cultivars, they're almost all American. We don't, except for one, Blauer Heinz, which is a dwarf English. And, and that one is, is, it's. I mean, those are better suited to our climate because that'll that comes into play when you use English, correct? Yeah, they yeah they seem to be. And so far, we haven't noticed any boxwood blight, which is a problem in our area. But fortunately, we haven't encountered it. Oh, well, fingers crossed. Yes. So, so Charles, let's, we'll bring you back in. So, so we have these two kinds that you're seeing out there, and let's let's bring the, the obviously the the climate, the English boxwoods, which again are our favorite of these old gardens. They're they're native to a climate that's not uh, all that's similar in many ways to the Northeast, correct? Right, correct. So it's uh, like the Mid-Atlantic, they would do pretty well. New England, they turn, well, maybe in your area too, they'll, they'll turn an orange color in the winter. So some people think that's interesting. Other people think, they're like, well, isn't it supposed to be evergreen? It looks like something's the matter. <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of that. Ruth is shaking her head. Yeah, no, we it live in a very windy area, and we rarely encounter something like that. Okay, so maybe it's like when you get into like let's say zone five. I'm seeing you're like zone six and seven, roughly. Yeah, we're we're six A and B, I think. So yeah, you know, I think in in the listening area that I haven't seen that happen. No. So that's that's interesting though. It sounds like you go up north a little bit, you get that, and that's with the English. 
Charles. Right, correct. That'll turn orange. You know, the American will turn, sometimes it'll turn orange. The English doesn't like heavy, not, none of the box with like heavy soil. Some of the Asian varieties here in Texas or in other parts of like upstate New York or New England, where it's like a clay soil, the English definitely wouldn't like that. Where like some of the Asian, the Korean and the Japanese, that'll, it'll tolerate almost the only only type of box with that'll tolerate like a heavier soil. I always think of the Asian species are better suited to the mid-Atlantic for some reason. There's similarities in climate and soil. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're like a, like a sandy, maybe a little more resilient if the, the weather's more extreme. Someone emailed yesterday in with a question. His name is Ray. This is, Charles, are you still there? I am. Ooh, let me patch up a little higher. Okay. Uh, this is, um, the questions are, which zones do we need to wrap boxwoods for winter? And what's the best way? And what would you recommend to use? That's the first question, Charles. Okay, okay very good. Let's see. You know, some of the properties we work out on the end of Long Island and the Hamptons, it gets pretty windy there. So sort of the, the winter protection. So there's the range would be do nothing if, it's, if, you, if you don't need protection. It can be, the plants can be sprayed with an anti-desiccant, which is like a wax-like coating, which you can buy yourself on a small uh, scale, or you have a tree care company, a health care company would spray your plant. If it's very windy, let's say if it's zone six, or, or like really more like zone five or very windy hilltop, you could wrap the boxwood. And so the important part is that there's, that the pressure you're wrapping it. You're wrapping it evenly, if that makes sense, so that there wouldn't be there's if there's a snow load that it, that it wouldn't collapse all on one of them. So you sort of wrap it evenly. Wooden stakes can even be added. So let's say there's like a row of three boxwood. You could put a stake close to each boxwood, so it would give the plants a little more support when you wrap them. And some properties, let's say that have a slate roof or a a, a metal roof, where the snow's sliding off under the boxwood, it's not necessarily necessary to wrap them. We've used um, an organic, like a sisal or a type of a twine, and we've loosely wrapped the boxwood in a, like around them, like you would a belt, and then that gave them added support when the snow fell on them. How interesting, so they don't split apart. Yeah. Right. So uh, what are we using to wrap? Uh, burlap? Uh, correct, yes, that, you know, that works. Uh, that's, you know, some, I know on some properties where they're wrapping not for the wind, but for the support from the snow. They've used uh, like a fine netting, like you would for, for deer fencing. So you, it's like a, like a fishnet stocking, more or less, you're putting around the plant. But just straight, regular burlap is what's often used. Interesting. Okay. The second question, I, I think I can answer this one because I have firsthand experience, but I'll, I'll throw this out to you, Charles. Is, uh, is Pachysandra a danger to boxwoods? You know, I made some notes prior to, like, to prepare for our talk today. So there are, there's boxwood blight. There's different kinds of bite, but blight, yeah. when they say boxwood blight, they mean the serious one. So Pachysandra, there's another plant called Sarcococca or sweet box. That's also like a low evergreen. Yep. Both of those, in my understanding, are hosts of boxwood blight. So, so if you're planting a new garden, you wouldn't want to put Pachysandra or, or sweet box next to boxwood. If you had, Pachysander near boxwood, something to consider is that because the Pachysander could host the blight and then it could travel to the boxwood. Interesting. Very interesting. I did not know that. That's a great help. Well, I hope Ray's listening because that's, that's, that's an answer I was not expecting, Charles. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's like a classic combination, you know, boxwood, Pachysander. Yes. There, there's a contrast. There's yes. small boxwood leaf or let's say like Vinca or Myrtle, another evergreen classic ground cover. But there's not the, the leaves of that ground cover are about the same as boxwood, so it's not a contrast, you know, visually. Okay, well, well, thank you for that. Let's we're on the blight. We might as well talk about it because I think that's for anyone who's familiar with boxwoods, uses them, is concerned about their health. That's the first thing on their minds. So, could you describe what that is? Ah, uh, sure. It, you know, it, it's fungal. It's my understanding. It's a it's spread via a spore. So imagine a spore is like a like dust. It's so minuscule, so it can spread 
small distances through the air is my understanding. So I'm, I'm not a scientist with any of this, but it also spreads by water splashing. So let's say there's a pack of Sandra and then next to it's a box where it rains, that water splashing lights can be transferred that way. It can be transferred when the oil company comes to your house or the propane or another company comes. That truck, that hose is going through landscapes all day. Um, so it could be transferred people that come to your house on their feet. So, so landscape crews, crews can transfer other, really anyone that comes to your property, you know, like the UPS person, if he's walking through your pack of Sandra bed, he's doing that at every house, <laughs> he or she. So it's, 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 it's fungal. There's not really a, there's not a cure for, for it. So there are, there's a company out of Europe, Buxus Care. They have a product. Um, I've chatted with them some. It's not a cure for it, so it's more or less keeping the plant as healthy as possible. That's the best defense. That's that's really alarming, especially uh, the listening area. It was there's very little uh, natural gas here, so there, most people either have propane or, or heating oil. So that involves a lot of hose dragging for homes. Right. <laughs> So you're, you're like the Paul Revere sounding the alarm to our listening <laughs> right. audience who have boxwoods. And it affects every type of boxwood, English, American, all different kinds. Well, you know, the, for, for listeners, and we can provide links and all that, the land-grant universities, depending on what state you're in, so like you have great information. If you just Google your land-grant university in your state and box plate. Um, okay. So the, the most susceptible, the, well... All boxwood can get it, and so it's not that. So the the English boxwood, like the straight English boxwood, that's unfortunately that's like the most susceptible to it. And you know, like the hybrids are somewhat resistant. That would be like green velvet. So there are varieties that are a cross between like an American and an Asian, which would be lots of these hybrids, which is often what's available at nursery centers. Then there's the Korean, like the winter gem. Winter gems, yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are quite, they're not the most, they're pretty resistant. The most resistant, so this is based on, I've looked at quite a few land grants. So Cornell, Rutgers, UConn, Penn State, Purdue, Virginia Tech, they pretty much have the same info. So the, the Japanese, so it's Bux's Japonica, that's about the most resistant. And so that one, there's a variety, I think it's called Green Beauty. Which, so there's just straight Japanese boxwood, Buxus japonica. That's quite resistant. And then I think it's green beauty. It doesn't get quite as large. So it's used when you want like a low hedge. What's the but texture like on that? It's like a medium size. So the leaf would be you know, about the size of your pointer finger, give or take. It's, so it's very shiny. It looks a little more boxwoody than, than the Korean variety, which leaf can get pretty big. Mm -hmm. That habit, the Korean boxwood, is a little looser. It's a little floppier. Yes. The Japanese is, is a, we have in front of our house in here in Houston, Texas area. We have them. It's, so it's, it can be a dense evergreen, you know, and, uh, and, and it responds well to shearing. So it's quite a good substitute. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. And plants like, there's the Saunders brothers. That they're in the Charlottesville, Virginia region grow boxwood they're good at, and they do lots of research on blight they've stopped growing the english variety just out of an economic necessity that it's like risky there's a variety called varder's valley so that looks pretty similar to boxwood that you're familiar with like the american that is very resistant we yeah you know, we have that on our nursery and that has always done very very well in our conditions so that would be like that would be the shining star to do more, you know, to do more of if that's working. It's adapted for a, for a, in a design condition, you know, that it's it prunes well, it transplants well. It's, it's very resistant to blight, is what the research shows. It's also been very resistant to wind on uh, our location. Oh, all right, so that's that's sort of where the future is going. Is these plants that without a lot of in intervention. Unfortunately, there's not a lot. There's not really a cure for it, so it's using species that are or, that are already tolerant of it. You know, I could, if you'd like, I could sort of go through some of like how to make boxwood healthy too, so so they're resistant to blight. Uh, 
Well, I would love to, yeah. Yes. Uh, so like the, you know, the real basic, um, planting it at the right, so not planting it too deep. So when you're, so Fox would like to be planted a little bit high. So if it's bald and burlap or if it's in a container, let's say the plant is like 24 inches tall, 24 inches wide, like a medium size. So maybe that's being planted out of the ground about an inch or so, give or take. So it looks like it's too high. And then you, you grade the soil from, from the crown of the root ball down. So that's like sort of the first step. And removing the leaf litter from underneath it. So just it's going to grow leaves and then it's going to shed the leaves. So keeping the, the mulching to a minimum or not really any mulch under the plant. Taking the leaf litter away at the end of the year. That's all possible, you know, breeding ground yeah. and a host for the blight. The pruning is real important. So that's if the plants are sheared during the heat of summer, that stresses them. So the during the dormant season pruning, if it's overgrown, you prune it, let's say in early April, give or take. And then thinning, where you're you're reaching inside the plant with these sharp sanitized tools and you're taking out a medium sized branch. And then so there, you're encouraging air circulation, uh, sanitizing your tools. So using isopropyl alcohol, which is like about 70% alcohol. The folks I chat with around the country, the plant health care specialists, scientists, say that's really, I was using like a kitchen disinfectant. Like you, you can imagine different brands of that. So they said the isopropyl is even better. Uh, on some properties we use, you know, where there's these historic there's hundreds or thousands of boxwood, a historic you know, hundred year old plant. We sanitize our feet, so we're spraying our feet with a with a isopropyl or a disinfectant. We're sanitizing our tools. And when possible, we have dedicated tools that stay on the property. So there's let's say three pairs of head shears. Those stay on the property. They don't ever leave that property. And then when we go and do work there, we use them. There's even booties, some of the online suppliers like you'd wear in a hospital, they have waterproof ones. So you're putting, so when you travel from even one section of a property to another, you're not contaminating. Those are some of the, the points that, I think I hit all the high points. So you're, are you sanitizing the tool between each plant? You know, like, like when possible. I mean, sometimes it's not feasible, but like if you're, they have a three acre property, and you're working in the front, you finish that, before you go like to the side, let's say, or the back, that would be ideal. Okay. I think cleaning up the leaf litter too is, is so important. Right. And this so leaf litter. To be, like you don't want to sanitize the landscape where there's nothing on the ground. Like you're, you don't want to be blowing it where you're blowing all the soil away. Right. Do you compost this or is this put in the, like the, in the trash? Uh, in the trash. So that's an important component when you read all the land grant literature on this. If the plant was like sick or diseased or, or the leaf litter, do not compost it because that, those, that fungus, it can live, I think they say five or six years. Even if it's not on a plant, it could just sitting somewhere, it can live that long. So you want to take that away like you would, you know, like, like your trash from your house. Okay. Well, that's, that, that's pretty core, but it sounds that's very important to do. Charles, let's 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 jump this to a, a brighter topic. <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> so it's, I, it, it's still hopeful. I mean, I travel yeah. all over North America. I don't see that much blight. I mean, it's it's definitely there. But if you're if you're doing these best practices, you really keep it to a minimum. Yeah, keep it from spreading. Right, and then if you're with replacing plants, if you're shifting toward the hybrids, like Ruth said, or the Korean or the Japanese, you can steer property. You know, gradually say let's. Like a row of ten died. Let's try a, like a, a variety that's a little more resistant. So I, I thought let's let's go into the designing with these because I, I think like well, I consider them to be a, one of the backbones of, of some formal or any kind of garden design, really, not necessarily mm -hmm. formal. Uh, it's because they are they're full, they're they're evergreen, they're nice screens, really nice texture, and there's so many things you can do with them. Maybe maybe you can discuss some of that. And I was preparing for this. I, you know, architects have all their materials, landscape architects, landscape designers. So the boxwood is a building block for a garden, whether it's, let's say, you have a nice you know, historic brick walk or bluestone, and then you come to a landing of where you're going to go up or down. There's steps. 
So a favorite technique of mine is just having a box on either side of that walk, where it really marks it and it causes you to pause. They can line a path where you're, you have a low hedge called a parterre, which just means of the ground, on the ground. They can be used for screening, where say there's a patio area, maybe it's very windy or sunny, or you have or your neighbors are next door. It's so magical about boxwood, it's range, and it really is from, from Texas all the way through New England. You know, grown in many climates, it responds really well to pruning. If you're pruning it properly, you know, that's what's used for topiary. It's it's so versatile. And there's really almost nothing like it. And then it's it's a very soft texture too. Where some of like a substitute would be like a Japanese holly, the very small leaf. That's not quite as soft and there's even you see online people pictures of people hugging boxwood. It's like there's it's like a stuffed and there's something in, like adorable about them. Especially in topiary form. You're right. I'm curious again to get back to the pruning. When you are pruning, doing this, uh, not not shearing, you're going in with with secateurs. That's what Phil calls them. Oh, right. And just going in and selectively taking out small pieces throughout the plant. Oh, right. Correct. You know, we've like we have a term you know, when we give we give talks around the country on this subject. Like the heading is often, "Have you petted your box with today?" <laughs> and so it's a simple, and you can, every, the listeners can try it. You can all try this. When you look at the plant, it looks maybe it look reasonably full by by actually with your hand physically petting it. You'll feel there'll be sections that'll be denser than others, but you can't really see it. So you like you'll pet it, and let's say there's an area that's pretty rigid, doesn't really give. Two hands, you open the plant, you spread open so you can see inside, and there's often a, a pretty big branch there. And so that is often a spot where you would cut that with a sanitized pruner. Secateurs. And so the cut is well within inside the plant. So once you take your hands away, the foliage covers it up. Can't really tell uh, that, that you prune. So okay. that sense of touch, that is really, I, I do trainings all over North America. So folks are often, Spanish might be their first language. Everybody understands children. You know, <laughs> it's like that sense of touch. And it's actually that simple. If it's dense, you know, remove that. And stand back and say, okay, can I take out any more? Interesting. That, that air circulation. And then it allows the plant, you think of if the plant is, let's say, a globe shape. If you're only pruning the exterior, the plant doesn't really have any room to put out new growth. And so to sustain itself, it needs to continually produce a new crop of leaves if it was, if it was agriculture. <laughs> so by thinning it, it's, allow, it's producing new growth from the inside. And it has a long way to grow. I have like three or four inches to grow where that's not going to be pruned. So that way you have to sort of this rolling development of new growth that you're not shearing. Very interesting. So much damage is done by shearing. Right. Like the mechanical, <laughs> it's one of those principles, gas trimmers, electric trimmers. They're mm-hmm. very, in theory, they're very efficient, but the tendency is, it's like you have a chainsaw in your hand. You're like, what can I cut next? You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's meant to cut where if you're, if you have hand shears, there's English versions, German, Japanese, they're all, all very good I mean, American too. I mean, like you're providing the power. So then you really just prune what's needed. Another phenomenon when we do pruning trainings, we say, where's the sun coming from? So in the in Northern hemisphere, it's coming from the South. So that side of the plant is often much denser than the North side. So by petting it, you can feel like, oh boy, this needs a lot of thinning. The north side might almost need none. That's they amazing. Mechanical <laughs> trimmers. Yeah. Mechanical trimmers, they want to prune everything evenly. Oh, yes. So Hell when you yeah. apply pressure evenly, you get uneven results, actually. You really need like that human discernment, like, oh, this back is like really thin. It doesn't need, doesn't need anything. Mm-hmm. Or when you have those gas trimmers in your hand and they're like, you know, chopping away, like, I better take off some here. And then the plant ends up being lopsided, actually. Wow. Wow. Charles, I have another uh, uh, pest question, because I've oh, seen sure. the American boxwoods get what well, looks like a leaf miner. That oh, correct. Them. Right. So like, there's the psyllids, there's all different types of leaf miners. So that... That's like a timing issue, right? Right. Correct. Doing, and I've had luck, like what I'll often do on properties, is I'll say, your plants have 
the leaves will be cur- will, will curl in response to that. So it's the insect. It's more. It looks similar to like a mosquito. Let's say where it's it's puncturing the back of the leaf, and there'll be small yellow dots that you'll see, like a just coloration, and then they'll curl. So having a plant healthcare team apply a systemic pesticide, so that's it inoculates the plant, so it stays within the plant. That works very well, and it's my knowledge it's not environmentally harmful and it's just really done like once a year about that so there are varieties like the Barter Valley, the Asian, the Korean, they're very resistant to those leaf miners. So the American ones are the ones that seem the most susceptible. Ruth is nodding her head. I, I we've right. we've had we've eradicated them on the nursery and without using very many chemicals at all, as as you oh, said. Right. That's um, right. Because the nursery inspector did discover them First year, and then the second year less, and this year there were absolutely none. Well, that's that's great news. Yeah. You know, we were working on a property in Toronto, and that particular person was a boxwood enthusiast and you know, very scientifically minded. And they had, it was a type of a beneficial wasp, which their plant health care person purchased, like in a larvae state. And these wasps eat but these leaf miners, I believe. You know, I, I was in Canada. I think are those the wasps that go into the ground, the large ones? It might be. You know, what, now they weren't harmful to people, is my understanding. Like it's, this is a, you know, this is a patio area. Right. They don't um, sting. They they burrow. Right. That, that might be the same. Yeah, I um, think that's it. You know, there's that's, there's always there's often a sustainable you know pesticide free approach. <laughs> mm-hmm. Charles, we, we've come to the end of the program pretty much. It goes by so fast. That's right. It's, it's been fun chatting with both of you. Well, I thought, what would you uh, leave our listeners who are very interested in, in, in using boxwoods, especially this area has so many deer. If you want any kind of evergreen, it, it's it, a lot of it does go to boxwood. You're right. You know, it's one of the most deer tolerant of the evergreen shrubs. Yeah. What would you, in like the next minute or so? <laughs> oh, I'm just, uh I guess I'm not sure what your question is. What would you tell tell someone who's interested in, in using boxwoods who has no experience with them? Uh, you know, like Ruth's finding a good good local supplier. What I like to when I visit a nursery, I nurseries might not be crazy about this, but I'd like to very gently, if it's in a container, let's say, is to gently pull the plant out and just see is it root bound? Are there lots of root? You know, just to make sure you're starting with a healthy plant. The land grant universities in your area could look them up and they they often will say, you know, this variety of plant of boxwood just does well in our area. There is, which I'm a member of, there's the American Boxwood Society, which uh, they have an annual meeting. They have boxwood handbooks you can buy. There's lots of online resources. The yeah, USDA, they have, uh, if, you, if you go to U.S. Department of Agriculture, type in boxwood, boxwood blight, they'll have information. So it might say, these are some choices you know, plants that are health that would do well in your area. Excellent. Okay. And Charles, now we need your, your websites for more information. I'm sure people are interested. Oh, sure. Let's see uh, some things we have to share. Our for-profit company is kinggardeninc.com or on Instagram, which is kinggardeninc. Uh, we have a podcast where we talk about yeah. all things landscape design and care. Right. There's a box of episode that's called In the Landscape. Or an Apple podcast, all the major ones. People could, on our King Garden website, you could sign up for our newsletter by emailing us, connect at kinggarden.com. Um, I'm going to be speaking this spring at the American Boxwood Symposium, which I think is going to be in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm working on articles for the European Boxwood Topiary Society. They have a website and a magazine. So there's, if you follow us on social media, um, keep you updated on all kinds of boxwood-related news. Awesome. Well, Charles, we've come to the end of the program. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Carl. And Ruth, thanks for having me. Great chatting with you. Thank you. Take care. So long. Okay, okay bye-bye.